summary, column development and destruction, rain, bugs and birds. A reverse thermal theory. Heavy shower of rain, hail, snow, which generate a local ground divergence. Look for higher cloud bases above and around the main shower cloud due to higher dry air carried with the main updraft and you have an artificial high cloud base. You see the normal cloud base and then we also have an artificial low cloud base towards the center where rain is coming down evaporating and cooling the air to a much lower dew point. Descending air is cooled by evaporation of water and downwards flow dragged along with falling rain. The surrounding air at normal day's temperature decides it's far too cold and up it goes. And you get a mini divergence around the base. A reverse thermal, well, these do not occur where the hills are. So here we go for a video which we're going to meter shower as we head up. Going for the rain shower. We're going to play this to the end which is 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Try one of your reverse thermals, shall we? Absolutely. Well, I suspect I need to wear that lace is. Yeah. Really it, it? True, but there's one on the nose, slightly left actually. Yeah, exactly. I would have gone left and then follow it round. Yeah, then, uh, About half eleven. as I thought it might be. Yeah, I think the strong thing of it. Yeah, what, we'll immediately downwind of it, yes. Yeah. Just this was the nearest cell to hook on to. Oh, we can always follow it around, can't we? You see the striations coming 12 o'clock now. Yeah. So was that a plan B I just heard? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this, this is almost overtaking us, isn't it?
In this picture, notice the cloud shadows indicating streeting to the left and to the right. The town with strongest thermal on a cloud shadow trigger, plus the sea breeze. The highest cloud is the strongest thermal, if you can get there in time. Lee Wind Hill Shadow Thermals Another trigger action for thermals can be downwind of a hill, caused by the wind going around the hill and then meeting up on the other side with a slight collision vector. In other words, convergence. This kind of action is routinely seen downwind of islands and forms long streets. It is an action which occurs around any hill with varying degrees of success in producing a thermal, depending on many things, but mainly the surrounding topography and the angle of the sun. Understandably, any time one wind is on a collision with another, referred to as convergence, an updraft will result. It happens a lot in the hills and in association with sea breezes. Thermal strength, size and shape. If the thermal you are in is giving two knots, but then accelerates and develops into four knots, there are several considerations. The drag of the bubble is proportional to the square of the speed. So if the speed is doubled, the thermal must have four times as much buoyancy to maintain the new speed. Clearly, if the original thermal ascends simply because it is relatively two degrees hotter, then it would now have to be eight degrees hotter. And this increase cannot just come from the relative temperature difference between the thermal and the air it is rising in quite simply because we would feel the temperature difference. However, drag is also proportional to cross-sectional area, form drag. So a reduction in radius would cause a reduction in drag, i.e. streamlining. If the thermal reduces its cross-sectional area, so reduces it by 75%, then the drag at its double speed is now the same as the drag of the original ascending broader bubble. As we cannot destroy the mass of the air in the thermal, then the thermal must change shape and become more streamlined and therefore vertically more bullet sausage shaped. Stronger thermals at this point are tighter. Further than for the street gust, my understanding is that the surge is exactly that and the vortex becomes much distorted as the air rushes up into a bullet shape. The surge is too narrow to turn within. It has seemingly huge associated sink on three sides and the considerable reduction in profile drag allows for the significant increase in speed. So here we have the thermal on the left and I put it in blocks to cover cross-sectional area. Here we have the transition of it turning into a bullet shape as it accelerates upwards. So if we want to reduce the profile of the thermal by a quarter, then we can see that we can reduce it like the cube into quarters and therefore again the round vortex shape becomes more bullet shaped. So it becomes much taller but narrower. Cold cylinder reinforcement then. The cold cylinder of descending air generates an updraft to the air it surrounds. Depending on the various levels of instability with height, this development can continue downwards and can extend all the way to the ground. Below about 500 feet, the downdraft forces air near the surface to be swept up and feed the developed thermal. Passing over large cold areas can kill this action, but it explains why thermals can travel and why they can appear unconnected to a ground hotspot even at low altitudes. The column development. Thermal maturity. 
So a better picture of the thermic sky is rather like this. This means that the thermal is not related to a ground feature but can get re-energized or calm depending what it passes over. A lake or the cool area downwind of a lake might kill it. Logically then, a thermal can achieve maturity quite quickly if the accelerating layer is quite low. Here we can see some pictures of castellation in this low level unstable layer of the now thermic sky which has started. We can see the notional line of any ascending air. A little later we can see the castellation which continues with some variation but the unstable layer is indeed very shallow. Descending air from the developing column i.e. the evaporation of the cloud at the top, drags the cloud even down to the ground. Thermal combination days. Bubbles re-hot and dry with little cloud. Columns have clouds. A column thermal hotspot. In this example on the left, there is a smooth and slight increase of wind with height no more than one knot per thousand feet, which the column thermal can accommodate. However, when it transits over a thermal hotspot, the faster rising air breaks the top of the thermal column in a whip action upwind, and the initial cloud decays whilst a new one forms slightly upwind. Sadly, however, the thermal is no longer self-triggering and the decaying cloud, coupled with a lack of hot air rising, causes a ripple in the column, the bend of which is too severe and the structure collapses. The column breaks apart. Another death of the column thermal. Wind shear on the column thermal. So a picture of the thermic sky, if there is a mild gentle wind shear, could look like this. On the left we have 10 knots of wind, there's a little wibble in the column with 12 knots at height and cumulus cloud at the top. However, if there is a significant break in the column, because the wind shear is too strong, thermals may still continue above this wind shear but they have to have high humidity providing the buoyancy. Uh, certainly if it's just hot air they will completely uh, break apart. The disappearing column thermal then. The controlling force is always the huge volume of descending air. The rate of destruction is generated downwards at twice the rate of climb. The stronger thermal goes higher into a stronger wind. And here's just a pretty picture of a break before the next subject. Rain, bugs, birds. Flying through rain. Just occasionally we encounter a light shower of rain. This produces two issues. The first is that the rate of descent will increase due to the poor performance and avoid following the director that says you need to fly a lot faster. You need to dry off the wings at slower speeds, so closer to endurance once clear of the rain. The second is that where the rain has fallen, it is unlikely that the air will be thermic. You have to glide out to where it either has not rained or far enough that the ground, towns, brown fields have dried out and are once again warming the air and generating thermals. You may fly through reduced sink before you get to the usable thermals. Bugs. Depending on the type of bug, there is a critical splat factor. 
At 50 knots, they bounce off and don't do much. But at over 60 knots, they splat and ruin performance. Bugs and rain. Bugs are bad for big wings because they have such a long leading edge. Meanwhile, rain are bad for broad wings because they have such a surface area behind the separation point where the water doesn't really uh, run off very quickly. Flying through rain. Here we have the rain shower and of course it's wet a large area upwind where it's been and there may be nothing for 10 or 15 miles depending how heavy the rain has been and so you've got to run a long way into wind if that's your planned track you eventually go into weak thermals by continuing further you'll get stronger thermals of course you're better deviating to where there are no wet surfaces Birds. Well, yes, not this type. Birds can be our friends. Of course, some birds are obvious. Some are not. Spot the bird. Here we have another bird of prey. Birds of prey are incredibly useful to us because they have no fear. They wish to get the tactical advantage and therefore they will turn inside us and try to outclimb us. So, so long as you can see them, they will help you regardless. They won't be intimidated by your presence. Of course, these are seagulls. The black-headed seagulls by the coast are quite useful. They soar quite well. The uh, more timid seagull inland is not so good. But the real th advantage of seagulls is they show us the structure of the sky from about 50 feet upwards. And they show us exactly the number of cells on a blue day and so on. And if we watch big flocks of seagulls, we can see the structure of the sky quite clearly. They tend to fly in straight lines though uh, from wherever they're roosting to their feeding grounds but they do show the structure at low level. These are starlings in fact but I have seen swallows nearly in these numbers at height when they're migrating. Swallows are good in as much as they show you where the strong thermals are, but those thermals are usually full of bugs. The mighty eagle is fantastic to fly with. They're fairly manoeuvrable too. We like to soar like an eagle whenever we get airborne. Buzzards often fly in pairs, they fly in families and they've got great eyesight of course. There's a couple of buzzards at Cranwell certainly which always join Agnes and I whenever we're flying. Crows also saw although they're not very useful to us. The red kite is a magnificent soaring bird and will pick up thermals from 20 or 30 feet. Here in thermaling mode, here in attack mode, here sorting out dinner. Summary, column development and destruction, rain, bugs, birds.